Okay. Uh, William is one of the uh, crazy people trying to involved in multiple uh, presentations these last two days. Uh, and in particular, he's involved in the space that I think is really important for the evolution and forward progress for eBPF and XDP, which is people actually building cool stuff using this technology so we know what the problems are, what the needs are, what we need to change, what we need to redesign, and how do we move things forward for other people who want to build cool stuff with these technologies. So uh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, so this is a talk about uh, eBPF, XDP, and open vSwitch. So um, this is a joint work with uh, Joe Stringer from Cilian, uh, Yifeng Sang, Yihang Wei from VMware. Uh, so I'll spend a couple of slides uh, explaining why we are doing this work. And then uh, we have two projects. Uh, one is OVS eBPF project, which we started about two years ago. And then recently, we start to work on the second project called OVS AFXDP project. So uh, at a high level, what is OVS? So OVS is a software switch implementation uh, running the hypervisor. So it allow, allow you to create, allow users to create multiple ports, and these ports can connect multiple virtual machines. And OVS is a programmable switch, meaning that uh, it doesn't know how to process the packet until you have a SDN controller and programs your network policy or network flows. Uh, in this case, we are using OpenFlow protocol into this switch. So for example, you can say, OK, forwarding from, you can install a rule saying that forwarding from this port to another port. Or you can drop a packet by saying, OK, uh, if the packet match these uh, kind of uh, headers, then drop it. And so today, mostly uh, OVS consists of two components. Uh, one is slow pass called OVS vSwitchD, and the, the other is a fast pass called uh, data pass. So when first packet comes to OVS, it always go to the slow pass. And slow pass has more complicated stuff like OpenFlow has so many tables, so many different fields to match on the packet and different type of actions. And after the slow pass doing the, uh, all the complicated things, it will install a flow, a single flow into the data pass, which is a fast pass. So that the subse subsequent packet will uh, hit the fast pass, which shows a much better performance in this case. So most of the use, ca to use case today for OVS, we have a kernel module, OVS, uh, openvswitch.ko inside the uh, Linux kernel, and the OVS vSwitch D daemon running uh, at the user space. So the kernel module just uh, register a receive uh, packet hook point and then do the rest of the processing in, in this kernel module. Uh, so, our motivation for the first project is that uh, <clears throat> for the long time, we want to add a new feature to the OVS kernel data pass, the kernel module. First, we have to implement this feature. And then because customer always runs older version of the kernel, then uh, we backport to the older version of the kernel. And then because kernel keep uh, changing a new, new version, so we also need to make sure that uh, our new feature indeed work correctly in the newer version of the kernel. And sometimes our customer runs the uh, non-standard kernel, like Red Hat has their own bad port, or uh, a customer run this uh, GR security patch. So that we also need to uh, change a little bit of our code. So uh, in the end, our kernel module ends up having a lot of uh, like if uh, define, else and sometimes nested define the else. So it's very hard to read and the bugs are very hard to find out. So that's uh, why we are thinking about using eBPF. So because eBPF have much more stable ABI and it's guaranteed to run uh, in the newer kernel. So if we implement everything today in this kernel, 
I can imagine that for the, uh, for the newer version, we shouldn't need to do anything. And also, most importantly, uh, in this model, we put all the feature in eBPF. Then it encouraged people to do more experimental stuff or to, to try something crazy because they only need to write a BPF code and this code will be pushed from the obvious user space to the kernel. So without uh, go, need to going through the uh, a mailing list or uh, discuss with uh, other things. They can try, thing, try new things by, their, by themselves. So eBPF, uh, I guess already, everyone already familiar. It's an internal virtual machine. Uh, it allows users to run a C program and then attach to a hook point. And then your program will be triggered to run when this event happens. Uh, it's guaranteed to be safe because uh, uh, by the BPF verifier. So it won't crash the kernel and it's uh, guaranteed to be terminated. It has a map which allows you to communicate with different eBPA program and also the user space program. And it has helper function to help you push uh, or retrieve data from the kernel. So the obvious eBPA project start by uh, writing the, start by uh, looking at the kernel module, the file under net open vSwitch. So all the implementation there, and then see if we can implement the same feature in uh, eBPF code. So we start by picking TC hook point, and then we hook our eBPF program there. And then we start to implement the parse uh, lookup and actions in this. Uh, basically, this is what we do in the kernel module. And then for communication with user space, we, uh, we use eBPF maps. So of course the first stage is to do, do header parsing. So we're not going to we are not parsing all the protocols. So we, we only parse the whatever protocols uh, is implementing the kernel module today. And we define a very similar flow key structure like struct uh, SW flow key. This is what uh, open vSwitch kernel module use. And we parse protocol data and we parse uh, metadata and then we in the end, we place this uh, flow key in the per CPU eBPF map. So in this stage, there are some difficulties. For example, stack is heavily used. Uh, for example, uh, the software, soft flow key is 40, 464 bytes, and it's getting close to the maximum. And also, this program is uh, pretty branchy. So uh, basically, after the parsing, we have to uh, create another BPF program because everything we do next probably increase the program's uh, complexity a lot. So after passing, then uh, second stage is called match and uh, action, as uh, match. So this is what we do in Linux kernel module today. So after passing, the pa we take this packet and we do a, a flow table lookup. And First packet always miss because the table is empty. So in that case, in the kernel module, we create, we take this packet, we create a nailing API, and then we send up to the user space. And then obvious VSD does all the complicated stuff, look up multiple tables, and then get the result, and then it will uh, again call flow installation, which uh, create another nailing uh, uh, socket, and then uh, write this uh, flow entry into the flow table. So we want to implement this logic in eBPF. Uh, so first we need a flow table in kernel. So we use a eBPF hash table. And then after the parsing stage, um, we want to pass it the packet to, first packet will miss the hash table lookup, and then we want to pass it to user space. So we use a perf ring buffer, the helper function, uh, which allows us to put packet and then to the user space. And then in the user space, we again converted this uh, packet into the Netlink API so that the rest of the obvious uh, user space code can be reused. And then when uh, OVS finished processing, it will uh, use the Netlink API 
uh, to do flow installation. In this case, uh, obvious uh, put packet into a TLB format, but how, uh, so it, which means each time the length might be different. So because the EBPF in the beginning, we have to, uh, the size of the map need to be fixed at the loading time. So we have to convert this uh, TLV, uh, netting TLV into a fixed length array and then uh, put into the EBPF map. So after this installation, the second packet or the subsequent packet can hit the flow in this uh, EBPF hash map. And converting the uh, netting TLV into fixed, uh, fixed length array will uh, waste some space and that's the cost we pay. So after we uh, find, after lookup stage, then it's the ne next stage is the action. So for example, uh, this is how kernel module does today. If we, wa if we want to do a uh, flooding, then uh, OVS will say, okay, actions equals to output this, output this packet to port nine, port five, port 10, basically all your port. Or if you want to do a mirror and push VLAN, then your lookup uh, result, the action will be output to three, which is your uh, original port. And then you push a VLAN tag, then output to the port number two, which is the uh, uh, port that send it, you, want to mirror, uh, you want to send the mirror packet to. So again, we want to implement this uh, in eBPF. So ideally, uh, in this case, we have a, in the action execution, we have a packet as an input. And then we have a for loop. And uh, we want this for loop to implement, to, uh, implement all our action from action one to the end of action. However, there are some challenges. For example, uh, today we don't support dynamic for loop. So that uh, we have to break this for loop uh, uh, using uh, tail call. So even, so first, first time I try, is I, I just use a maximum a static upper bound of the for loop. Uh, like I always execute 32 or 64, but then we hit another limitation that the uh, eBPA program has maximum size of 4K. So if, for example, if you are, uh, if you have action list that has many elements, like many actions to do, then you might hit the, the limitation. So we end up breaking each action into an independent uh, eBPA program. And then at the end of the eBPF program, we have to do a map lookup to see what's the next, next action to execute, and then execute another uh, actions. So with that implementation, uh, we can get something working. So we set up two machines using uh, Tangit Nikar, connected them back to back. Um, the machine on the left is a traffic generator sending 14 million packet per second, uh, 64 byte UDP packet. On the right hand side, we run OVS uh, kernel module and compare with OVS uh, eBPF implementation. Uh, we measure using single flow, single corn. Um, so <clears throat> the blue table shows the kernel module, OVS kernel module today. So output means that action equals to, to output. So uh, it means that you take the packet from one port and then you do parse lookup and actions equal to another port. So basically you are taking packet from one port, do some processing and send it to another port. So it shows 1.3 million. If you do something extra, for example, receive a packet and then modify the uh, destination MAC address, then output so it drops a little bit. And uh, then if you do a tunnel, for example, you set tunnel, uh, pack comes in and then you push a GI tunnel and then you output to another port. Then because it traverses the Linux stack another time, so it dropped to 0 0.5. So compared with the eBPF data pass action, uh, first we did a, something called redirect. So redirect is at the TC layer, we don't do anything. So it's just no parser, take the packet and from one port and just forward it to another port. So it just, it shows 1.9 million. And then uh, the second one output is with our obvious uh, eBPF implementation. 
having parser lookup and actions. It shows 1.2, oh sorry, 1.1, uh, and then we set the extension Mac output and GRE tunnel uh, output. It shows 1.1 and 0.4. So we see around 10 to 20 percent uh, performance overhead. Uh, it's not because of the eBPF, but because of the limitation of the eBPF, so that we have to change some design. For example, we have to break the action into multiple tail call and then every time do extra lookup. So I guess that's the reason it shows a little bit slow. So <clears throat> right now we are working on a uh, couple features, for example, mega flow support and basic connection tracking. Uh, for more difficult one like packet defragmentation and LG, we still don't know how to do, so this is still under discussion. So the lesson learned from this project is that uh, Taking the existing features like kernel module code, obvious kernel module code, and convert it into eBPF is a little bit hard. Although they are both C code, and, and then you cannot say copy this 10 line of code or 20 line of code from your kernel module and then to eBPF code. I guess this is because, for example, for loop have to, uh, there's no for loop support, so we have to break our program, or there's limited stack size. Uh, or uh, uh, there's no dynamic memory allocation there, so we have to do a lot of conversion. So uh, it ends up that uh, when you want someone to do this work, uh, they should, actually they have to change their mindset a lot. Like it's not, although it's all C code, but it's totally, it's totally different. So <clears throat> then we start to think about uh, this uh, AFXDP work. So. <clears throat> If uh, pushing all the obvious data path feature into uh, eBPF code is uh, difficult, then maybe we can try retrieve the packet from the kernel as fast as possible, and then do the rest of processing, the parse lookup, the tunnel implementation, whatever, in the user space. Uh, so it has two concerns here. So first, once we take the, the packet to the user space, uh, then we lose all the chance of using the kernel's code. For example, today, OVS kernel module use a lot of uh, tunnel implementation, VXLAN, Geneve, uh, GRE, ERSPAN. Or we use uh, QoS, the TCQoS, and, and we also use the <coughs> data structure there. We use uh, uh, net filter connection tracking feature in our kernel module. So bring packet to user space means that we have to uh, do everything there in user space. And second is the performance. So usually taking packet to user space is has extra overhead like context switch and uh, packet copy. So luckily for the first problem, uh, we have uh, this another user space data path implementation called uh, DPIF NetDev. So today it's uh, similar implementation than our, uh, to our kernel module, but mainly used by the DPDK community. So in the DPDK world, they take the packet from the hardware and then send it to the user space OVS, to the, uh, this user space data path. And then it has another implementation of, uh, of the OVS they are passed. Uh, so the second problem about performance, so uh, luckily we have this uh, XDP and AFXDP. So uh, <coughs> XDP means express data pass. It's an EPP hook, hook point that uh, can access packet at a very low level at a device driver level. And with AFXDP, uh, it allows us to create a socket type that receive and send packet friend from at a very high speed. So that, uh, so that uh, the only thing we need to do, the only thing different from the socket is that we have to do this extra uh, programming or maintenance of this uh, RX ring, TX ring, and uh, completion ring and field ring. So uh, the, this project, OVS AFXDP, is about taking the packet from the driver XDP layer and then creating a AFXDP socket 
as a user space, and then reusing the database today used by the DPDK community. Then what, uh, what OVS should do in this case is that, so AFXDP introduced something called UMAN. So UMAN is a user space memory allocated by the user space program. In this case, it's OVS vSwitchD daemon. And then UMAN will, so UMAN is a chunk of memory. Uh, in our case, we allocate two KP chunk. And then we'll have to map this uh, UMAN to the Linux kernel so that it becomes a shared memory between your user space program and kernel. It has fill ring and completion ring. So fill ring allows kernel to receive packet and then put it into one of the uh, UMAN element, your packet data there. Completion ring is a way to, from kernel to let the OVS know that you already uh, send your packet. Uh, <clears throat> and then for the RX ring, uh, is for users to receive packet that uh, received by the Linux kernel. And for TX ring, is something uh, OVS, for OVS to put the packet into TX ring and then ask the Linux kernel or FXDP to send it out. Uh, and also it was to mention that the component in this uh, ring is a descriptor, so pointing to the one of the human elements. So there's no data copying between them. So it's just address, po address point to the uh, 2K chunk uh, data in human, and your, your, your packet is always there when you are doing transmission, receiving uh, user space and kernel. So to receive a packet, we need to program RX ring and uh, fill ring. And to transmit packet, we have to program TX ring and completion ring. So I'm going to go through an example how OVS uh, do reception. For simple, for simple case, if we only have eight human elements in the beginning, and then we have uh, fill ring and RX ring. And we also need an extra data structure called UMAN mempool, which uh, keep track of, which is a free list, keep track of uh, available UMAN element. So in the beginning, we obviously will get four available UMAN element and put it into the field ring so that, uh, and mark them in use. So, once we put a uh, descriptor in the field ring, kernel can receive these four packets. And once the receive is done, kernel will transfer the ownership from the field ring. So from this uh, one, two, three, four into the RX ring. And we, at this time, we want kernel to be able to keep receiving packet. So we have to get another four packet uh, for you available human element and put it into a field ring so that the uh, kernel can keep receiving uh, and put it into the field ring. After this stage, OVS start to process the packet on the RX ring. So this is, then this is just standard OVS code which does parse, lookup, and actions. And uh, no, right now we don't have any available human element. So once OVS finished finish processing this four uh, packet, then we can recycle this uh, four, four human element back to the uh, human pool so that uh, next packet or, uh, can, can use that. Uh, there's a similar logic for the sending side. Uh, I put in the paper so you can take a look. So our in initial implementation, the performance is not so good. So I have to uh, apply this optimization. So first one is called pool mode driver uh, mode. So without pool mode driver, OVS, uh, OVS use pool system call and then wait for new I.O. This turned out to be pretty slow because every time you go to the Linux kernel and contest switch back, it takes a couple microseconds. So I have to use this uh, dedicated thread to keep pulling the uh, RX ring. Also, we mentioned this uh, human memory pool design. Every time we want to get some free element from the uh, human list, and sometimes we want to put it back, recycle it back when we finish. So uh, we want the fast data structure to do this operation. 
And there are some standard things like uh, pre-allocation. So we don't want to allocate any metadata when we receive packet. We want to allocate, uh, allocate in the beginning and pre-set up, pre-initialize some, some data structure and also uh, some system called batching. So about the human design, so actually it has only two operations. So first, run, uh, first is get. So it says get uh, four, for example, four free human elements from the human pool. Or after OVS process it, we say put four elements back to the list. So that's it. Uh, <clears throat> then I implement three data structure. First one is Lilo list head. So uh, second one is five four pointer ring. The last one is live four pointer array. So it turns out the last one shows the better performance. So uh, live four is basically a push pop style. So because I guess because we have a ring and every time if we do push uh, pop on the top of the uh, the stack, then we kind of always reusing uh, the first. Uh, for example, first 200 human, instead of, if we have a ring with tail and head and tail, we'll end up, end up using all the human element in the, in the memory. So I guess this is more cache friendly. And maybe, you should, so <coughs> maybe this is, more, this is more clear. So point, then we allocate all the uh, pointer in this pointer array. So this pointer array will point into the uh, unused element in the human. So putting all the uh, all the address in an array um, is also more cache friendly because like you can do batching like take 32 or take 16 uh, pointer in, in one operation. Uh, then once we receive packet from uh, AFXDP, we need to allocate the metadata. So in the case of OVS, it's called DP packet. Again, we have two designs. One is to use single chunk of memory for both data and metadata. So this is similar to DPT case and buff de design. Basically, you reserve probably 500 bytes in front of your packet data. And then every time you access, you can just do an offset. Or the second design is you have a separate uh, dedicated buffer for all your uh, all your metadata. And then we found out the second one, uh, this one is shows better performance. So uh, in this design, we actually, in the beginning, we, we allocate the same amount of uh, um, metadata as the number of um, human chunk, and then do one-to-one -one mapping. And then when packet comes, we can do batching more easily because we can say process a batch of packet by accessing this memory and uh, also the packet data memory. So I guess this reduced the uh, cache miss a lot. So again, we measure this performance. Uh, this time we upgrade our hardware by using 40 gig NICAR. Uh, thanks for the Melon of Sky. Uh, so right now we use a <coughs> 4 ticket uh, NFP 4000 uh, running DPDK to send uh, 19 million packet per second uh, to the server on the right, which we use uh, Intel XL710. And then we run OVS with the AFXDP there. So again, this is also single flow, single corn, uh, 64 byte packet with AFXDP uh, zero copy more. And I disable, I disable the spectrum and meltdown uh, patch. So we compare the performance with uh, the XDP sub micro benchmark program uh, in the kernel source. So there are two applications. Uh, one is called RxDrop. So in the obvious RxDrop does parse lookup and actually into to drop. In the case of XDP suck, it doesn't touch packet. For the L2 forward, OVS does parse lookup and action equals to change the MAC address and then output to the same port as it received. Um, <clears throat> so we compare the performance. So for the receive side, uh, it's the same. We can get 19 million packet per second. 
For the L2 forward, it's a little bit slow. I think um, some of the same uh, system code has overhead. I have to optimize it. So in terms of future work, uh, right now it's all forwarding packet from physical port to physical port. So next time, I, next thing I want to try is to try forwarding packet to virtual machine. I would expect it will be much slower because for example, for virtual machine or container, we have to create a tab device or vSphere device. And then from obvious to, from right, because right now packet is already in user space, right? So to send the packet to uh, vis or tab device, we have to push that packet back inside the kernel. So I guess it performance, performance will drop. Uh, so either we uh, can support AFXDP for the uh, vSphere or tab device, or another option is to uh, use a vhost user, user mode. So the packet in user space can directly uh, create a, a, v, a vert IO uh, format packet and send it to the vert IO front end, either in virtual machine or in container. Also, the second one is we want to bring the feature parity between the user space and kernel data paths. So today, our kernel module has more features than our user space code. For, uh, for example, I think connection tracking, they are still, uh, kernel is still more complete than user space. Um, so in terms of discussion, right now, OVS is always using 100% uh, CPU. Uh, actually, two CPU will show 100%. One is a case of an IRQ daemon, and the other is a pool mode driver of uh, the OVS, created by OVS. So we are thinking about how to balance this PMD when the traffic is not so, traffic rate is not so high. And also we want to compare with DPDK, uh, not because of the, not in terms of the performance, but in terms of uh, the deployment difficulty or how to uh, ease of the, the management. So finally, in comparison of these uh, three, so first one, <laughs> I think in terms of maintenance cost, uh, obvious eBPF, I see it's low if we have everything there because if we have everything in eBPF, then we basically can do whatever we want and push all the feature from the, the user space. For the AFXDP, it's also low, but it's because right now we implement everything in user space and then we change everything there. Kernel module is high because the ABI change and, and some other, uh, and some other state. Uh, for performance, AVS, oh, AFXDP is high because of this uh, uh, fast AFXDP to the user space. Uh, in terms of development effort, OVS EPPF is uh, still a little bit difficult. If I want someone, some experienced uh, C programmer to implement a feature in, in EPPF, then it still takes some time. AFXDP is easier because it's then user space, easier to debug, easier to uh, call into other library. Uh, in terms of new feature deployment, I would say eBPF is easier to deploy because right now customer today runs very many different uh, kernel version. And then if we can uh, have this in eBPF, then once we know the version support, then we can deploy it. And so, so does AFXDP. Uh, but in terms of safety, I think OVS eBPF is much higher because the verified guarantee and uh, the code is safe. Then in terms of another two, it's actually depending on the uh, reviewer. Okay, that's, uh, thank you. So I, I wanna address a, a couple points. Uh, so since you're going through the classifier to do the eBPF implementation of the OBS data path, yeah. you're not getting the benefits of XDP wherein we had to make an SKB, we okay. had to traverse into the, the packet scheduler layer and then get to your eBPF program. So there's some fixed overhead mm -hmm. there. So if you went to an XDP-based solution, you could eliminate some of that overhead. Yes. 
Uh, another thing to take into consideration is you talked about virtualization and pushing in and out of guests. Yes. And with the AFXDP situation, you have the same problem DPDK has, where that you have to cross the protection boundary again to push the packet back into the virtualization layer. Yes, yes. If you were able to get feature parity with the BPF solution with XDP, as you get with AFXDP, hmm you would be in the kernel already and you wouldn't have to cross this protection boundary again. Yeah. So there is a huge incentive to somehow make the BPF implementation mm -hmm. performant. Mm -hmm. So I just I think those are all the things you need to consider as you move forward and decide how to attack different mm -hmm. approaches. Yes. So, any questions for William? Mm -hmm. yep. um, one of the pain points, if you consider OVS with TC offloading, is that the flow install rate can be quite low. Uh, have you considered this one when doing this project? Sorry, your question is uh, TC, what is very low? TC of low is very low? Yeah, TC of loading can be quite slow. Especially quite slow, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And if you try to insert like 1,000 flows in the data path, they can get even slower and slower as the amount piles up. Mm. And have you considered how fast or how slow it can be to add a new flow in the data path while oh. using eBPF? R right now, the, we implement flow in eBPF map. So every time we install flow, it's basically updating the eBPF map. Uh, so we are not using TC of flow today. So another way to think about this is, so OVS has a backend for the data plane, which is make TC flower rules oh, yes, yes. and offload that onto the hardware. Okay. What if you generated your BPF program in the flower classifier, taking all these rules into consideration? Oh, okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So that's another idea we, we, mm. we people talk about. So if we had a BPF program generated from the TC flower rules, you oh, you can yes. Okay, okay. So that's a that's oh. a third approach. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. there's many different avenues to attack and. Again, the eBPF-based solution would be superior for the virtualization case, as we discussed earlier. So mm. there's very a lot of things to think about. Okay. There's another hand that was up over here. Yeah. Uh, do you have numbers comparing the performance of uh, OVS AFXDP to OVS DPDK? Oh, uh, I don't. But OVS DPDK people do the performance comparison of OVS DPDK a lot. So right now, I think our implementation is slower than obvious, obvious DPDK because uh, I think there are still some optimization I have to do, yeah. But basically, I would say as the obvious, the data path layer, they are, we are using almost the same code. So if there's extra overhead or obvious AFXDP is slower, then it's probably because of the interface. I try to receive the packet from AFXDP create some overhead. Once we get the packet, then it's the same uh, obvious DPDK. That is the same code as obvious DPDK. Uh, what, uh, sorry, one thing I need to mention is that right now, uh, if we get packet from obvious DPDK, then it already has this Rx hash there. But in the case of AFXDP, we have to uh, calculate the Rx hash. Um, another thing, with, you, you mentioned that um, you're using facilities in the kernel like connection tracking and yes. VLAN offloads and so on. So like, to expand on what Dave was saying, if you go the route of, like right now you're implementing eBPF but not getting the, AF, the HTTP speed up because you're still going to the stack. So one thing you could think about is which features from the kernel do you need? if you were to implement it in XDP and which helpers would be useful mm -hmm. to try to hook into some of these features, mm -hmm. um, even from an XDP context, so that you can get the speed up, but still use what you need to do from the rest of the kernel. So do you, so just to recap, so do you, you say that to compare these two performance, I can basically see what so the overhead right now in OVS eBPF, and then implement some of them in the XDP layer so that the two Will have or, or if you move the whole data path into XDP, oh, okay, okay. what mm -hmm. subsystems would need to be able to handle SKB list packets mm -hmm. that cannot currently do so, connection tracker would be one of those locations. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And probably the QO is... Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. that too. Thank you. 
So in OVS, when you insert uh, uh, flows into flow table, how do you evict uh, stale flow keys? How, how do I what stale? Evict, evict. How do you? Oh, evict. How do I evict? Okay. Yes, yeah, so OVS has uh, another thread called revalidation. So from time to time, I think in one second or something, it will check uh, whether we need to remove or whether the entry in the data pass is up to date. So if not, then it will try, we'll delete it. So in the case of OVS eBPF, we'll just uh, do remove this entry from the uh, eBPF map. The okay. So, so on that note, it's, it's actually quite interesting that um, like we've got some stuff in Cilium which is doing, um, we've got a connection tracker and we're, we're trying to time out entries there as well. And uh, if you have a large number of these entries, like you're doing, like if you want to delete it, that's at least two syscalls per entry in your map and if it's like 100,000 of these or something, you basically burn a whole bunch of CPU just trying to like time out entries in these, in these maps. So I think uh, that, that'll be an interesting sort of area for, uh, for some infra. Infra. Another thing is if people configure, they, people want to transparently configure OVS and the connection tracker and then this XDP thing just does the data path and then I can still dump my connection tracking table and see all the things that are happening. Maybe you get less of that because you're controlling the whole scenario with Cilium and that's like you can provide some other interface to dump the connection tracking table or the state. Whereas people using OVS have a different set of expectations. So yeah, it's, so it's, that's, and traditionally connection tracking has been known to be an easy way to overload a system with the recycling of the entry, so that is a very serious concern. Anyone else? All right, you're free to go to lunch. Thank you. Thank you.